Welcome to our vision to action session on building trust from the beginning, becoming a first time supervisor brought to you by United Way of Central Maryland and Emerging Leaders United. I am Eric Rosenberg, and I'm excited to be your host this afternoon. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a member of the senior leadership team for Truist Commercial Banking Division in the Maryland region. For those of you who don't know what Truist is, we are the resulting merger of two powerhouse banking brands, SunTrust and bb and Truist is proud to be a longtime supporter of United Way, and I want to give a quick shout out to all of my teammates joining tonight, especially the Truist Generations Business Resource Group for rallying behind ELU by promoting the event and showing up in force this afternoon. In addition to working with such a phenomenal team in my day job, I'm also a member for the Executive Council of United Way of Central Maryland's Emerging Leaders United Group. Those of you who are contemplating getting involved with our organization, I first want to thank you for supporting us this evening. Second, if you are thinking about getting more involved in any community organization, I encourage you to consider you, your why. When I think about ALU, my why is simple. ELU gives me access to amazing programs and resources like this one, uh, which make me a better leader and a better human being. Why does that matter? because I serve dozens of constituents every day. Most importantly, my baby boy, Ben, and beautiful wife, Molly. And I have found being a good leader, good father, and good husband always starts with being a good human. Now I'm gonna pause. I'd like to take a minute to ask my fellow EOU council members to say hi in the chat. There you go, guys. If any of the attendees like what you hear tonight and have more questions about ELU, don't hesitate to reach out to any one of us, especially these other phenomenal leaders, so they can also share their why, uh, is why they spend time with, with ELU. Also, as many of you know, ELU's signature conference has evolved into a series of virtual and in-person events we're now calling the Vision to Action Conference. Today's professional development session is the third of three sessions designed to help you grow as a professional and give back to our communities. Don't forget to join us after this session for a networking happy hour to continue the conversation. Before I pass this to our esteemed speaker, I'd like to share a little bit about Bowie Carpenter and frankly, why I am so excited to hear her thoughts tonight. Bowie Carpenter, JD, currently serves as Senior Associate Vice President for Development and Alumni Relations at the Johns Hopkins University as a member of the Development and Alumni Relations Executive Team. In her role, Ms. Carpenter partners with multiple leaders to drive progress in six operational areas, oversees the development programs for five of the university's programs, and partners with institutional leadership, including the university's president, provost, and deans, to advance all aspects of engagement and fundraising. Ms. Carpenter began her professional fundraising career in 1996 at the University of Memphis, where she served as both an annual and major gift development officer. She began working for the Johns Hopkins University in the year 2000 as a senior associate director of development for the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. She was promoted to director of development for the Johns Hopkins Department of Surgery in 2003 where she worked directly with the chair of the Department of, of Surgery and with the faculty of eight divisions to secure and steward principal and major gifts. We're only up to 2007, guys. That's when she rose to became the executive director of Centers of Institutes and the Fund for Johns Hopkins Medicine. Then in 2011, she was promoted to associate vice president. As associate vice president, she provided leadership, strategic direction, and planning for private sector fundraising in support of Johns Hopkins Heart, Vascular Institute, Brain Sciences, Children's Center, School of Medicine, Office of Medical Annual Giving, and Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida. She assumed her current position in February of 2016. Ms. Carpenter received her bachelor's degree from Purdue University and her Juris Doctorate degree from Tulane University School of Law. Given such an exciting background, I can't think of many people more qualified to speak on tonight's topic. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce the group to Bowie Carpenter. Thank you so much, Eric. That was such a wonderful intro. I think I should take you along with me everywhere I go. <laughs> 
I am so excited to have time with everyone today. And I know that most of you probably just came from Erin Hankin's session on listening. And I'm so glad because, you know, exploring listening skills and the art of asking questions and being an active listener are really are all the important things that you need as you start your management and your leadership journey. So I think that you're well primed from the session that you just came from, and I am hoping to take you down another lane. Um, we're going to have a little bit of fun, I hope. I want this to be a session where people feel comfortable enough to interact. Um, and as we get started, I'm going to start right off the bat by asking questions where you can do a thumbs up using your reaction or a thumbs down. So who on this sort of in this session wants to be a bad manager? Thumbs up. Who wants to be a bad manager? I don't see any thumbs, okay. Okay, here's the next one. Who in this session has had a bad manager? Thumbs up. <laughs> I definitely see a lot of thumbs up. All right, so now we're gonna do something going into a Slido word cloud and a screen is going to pop up where the question for you is, what are the words that you would use to describe a bad manager? And what you can do is take your phone and go to the QR code and it will take your phone right to where you can put in um, your answers or the link that's in the comments. So they're going to start popping up. What words would you use to describe a bad manager? Like controlling, micromanaging has gone up. So we're just gonna wait for like 30 seconds or so to see what words pop up. I love that we're not short of any words describing having a bad manager. I love all of the participation, thank you. Okay, we still got more come. I love this. All right. So what I'd like you to do is take your phone and take a picture as I am right now of this word cloud so that you can save the image. We can also provide this image after as well. Okay, but, perfect. Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So we can pull it down now. Thanks very much, Katie. So I want you to have that image because nobody ever wants to be any of those things, right? But people show up in that way to other people. And I want you to have it as a reminder of when you are struggling with managing and leading just take a look at that and see what pops up. And you probably saw that micromanaging was the largest word in the word cloud. And that is probably the most, which I didn't even plan it, but I suspected the most um, number one thing that people think managers, poor managers do, and that is micromanage them. So I wanna make sure that nobody ever uses any of those words to describe you as a manager leader. Um, so I'll just do a little bit of framing before we kind of kick into the rest of the session. But I just thought it was really important to ground us in terms of how it is that bad managers can show up for people so that you have a sense of what that looks like visually as well and that you have a way to keep that and reflect on that. Um, so, you know, managing in, especially in a, a managerial role where you have a supervisor above and a team below is one of probably the most difficult positions to occupy in an organization. And it's really because being a manager 
requires you to be a translator between tactical thinking and strategic thinking. And so the tactical part of it is getting the work done, providing instruction, providing direction, giving feedback, and then the strategic thinking is being innovative and problem solving and creating and leading. So it really is one of the more difficult um, areas to get your, your solid footing because it really does require you to go from one extreme to the other where you're using completely different skill sets. So there are a few things that I sort of want to walk you through that I think are really key pieces for being a manager, being a first time hiring manager and also building trust. So we're going to go through a number of things. I'm going to share screen because I have a handful of slides that I'll pop up, um, but I will take down um, as well. So we're not, I don't want it to be slide heavy, but I want you to sort of see some of the, some of the slides that I think are really key. I can't believe my phone is ringing. I swear it hasn't rung in like two and a half years. So that's really interesting. All righty. So emotional intelligence is something that if you could commit this slide to memory is something that really we need to dig into. Here is sort of a, a data point that was in the Harvard Business Review. According to a study, by the Harvard Business Review. Emotional intelligence accounts for nearly 90% of what sets high performers apart from their peers that have sim similar technical skills and knowledge. So if there are two people that have the exact same skill set, usually the one that is excelling the most is the one that has emotional intelligence. And that really speaks volumes. So today what we'll talk about is, this is a lot to take in and there are many, many different courses sort of spread within this. Um, but what we'll focus on a little bit today is the self-awareness piece and the relation man relationship management piece of it. So I know that you will get these slides. So I'm just going to stop sharing for now. Oops. I stop sharing my screen for you. Okay, sorry, didn't see that. Oh, for some reason, sorry, the, the PowerPoint presentation has taken over and I'm not seeing any of you on my screen. There we go, sorry about that. So, you know, emotional intelligence really is sort of a lot of things. It's sort of energy and motion. So there's sort of a psychological fight and flight that we think of in terms of how we react to things. There's the subjective experiences in terms of kind of how you experience the world, your ego, um, and then informed experiences based on your background and culture and all those um, other pieces. And really in order to have better self-awareness, it helps to understand your feelings and your motives and your character. And self-awareness actually usually has a lot to do with whether you're satisfied at work, um, whether you're happy. And you know, there's internal self-awareness, which has to do with sort of your values, your passions, strengths, weaknesses. And then there are the external pieces, which have to do with how other people view you. So what we're going to do now is we are going to go into a breakout room and I'm gonna ask you to take another picture of two things. And I want you to think about kind of what your superpowers are and what your kryptonite is. So if you could take your phone and just take a, an image of this, because I know when you go into the breakout room, you're not going to have the presentation in front of you. Um, I think you're going into four breakout groups and group one and two will be superpowers and group three and four will be kryptonite. So here's the kryptonite slide for you to take a picture of. So take a picture of both of these. And you're going to be in this breakout room for about six minutes or so to talk through some of these questions. And then we will come back and have a conversation about your superpowers and your kryptonite, which are really important in terms of your self-awareness. 
So hopefully you've had, you've taken the pictures so that you can go into your groups. If you see you're in group one or two, your superpower. And if you are in group three or four, your kryptonite. And I know Katie, who's doing an awesome job, is now going to send everybody into breakout rooms and we'll be back in about five or six minutes. Yep, you'll see an invite come through in just a second. They're finishing up right now. Great, thank you.
nice to see everybody coming back. I was excited that I got popped into a group myself and I got to eavesdrop. Is everybody back? In about 10 seconds. All right. All of a sudden it multiplies. <laughs> Welcome back everyone. I hope that you got to have some good quick conversations. I was able to be in a session and what was really interesting, I was in a superpowers session and everybody was struggling because all they could think about was their kryptonite, which is sort of part of human nature as well is that we always want to go to what we are not doing very well instead of thinking about the things that we are doing very well. So if you think about sort of the internal self-awareness, that is sort of what our superpowers are, that we should have a sense of what our superpowers are and what we do well. And so the external self-awareness is some of that kryptonite where we're getting feedback from other people, um, letting us know how they think we don't show up necessarily in the ways that they'd like to see and using that to really help build our self-awareness. Um, Superpower in action, kudos for being detail-oriented, Cheryl, okay. So um, what I'm gonna do now is you can pop up another board and list kind of what some of the superpowers are that were identified in the conversation and then there'll be another board that lists the kryptonite. I thought that might be a great way to do it so that nobody feels that um, they're having to self-disclose what their superpowers are or their kryptonite. So, Again, there's the QR code and then the link in the chat. Just type, start typing in what your superpowers are. Great, starting to populate. So people focused, analytical, detailed, hard work, making others comfortable with public speaking, listening, organization. So these are all ways that um, people produce at work, right? For being the tactical side of things. Detailed, empathetic, great. I think there's one person still patient, still typing. So because this will be saved and you'll be able to get it, I'm not gonna tell everybody to take a picture because I know it goes way down. But again, a reminder of what superpowers are and then we'll pop up our kryptonite and have a chance to see um, what some of those looks like. I know this is a much harder one to type in, but nobody can see who's typing. Not good at saying no, bad attitude, decision-making, intensity, other people. I like the smiley face, imposter syndrome, indecisive, not as detailed, not always detail-oriented, confrontation. People are typing. So it's interesting that our kryptonite list is getting longer than our superpower list. So great. So one of the things that I just want to touch on is that all of these things that we're typing in, in terms of kryptonite and superpowers, are all tied to emotion in some way, shape, or form. And so um, we have a certain feeling about how, how we feel about our superpowers and also how we feel about our kryptonite. And thank you very much, Katie. We can pull the poll down. So how, how do you feel naturally when you think about those things that you need to work on that are your kryptonite? Are you eager 
to go start working on them and taking those feedback points? Not really. So one of the things that should be a takeaway is you will get the slides, but really take some time with the slides to think about what your superpowers are and your kryptonite. You most likely will have a lot of emotions tied to what your kryptonite is that might prevent you from focusing and working on those things. Um, but make sure that you have the dedicated time to really, whatever the things are that you've identified and how people have given you feedback, you use that um, to help. Um, so the next thing I wanna touch on is relationship management. And the reason that relationship management is an important piece of emotional intelligence is that it actually affects how you can influence. And when you are a manager, you'll find out that um, you are not necessarily in the highest position of power. And the person who is, is the one that gets to make the decisions and might be sometimes authoritative, hopefully not collaborative is what we would hope for. But the way that managers tend to get a lot of things done is through the influence that they have based on the networks that they build. And so thinking about networks, think about how you can be very intentional in creating your networks, both internally to your vertical line and also outside of the organizational line, because sometimes the networks that you're building that might just be within your vertical are not going to be the ones that can help you with influence. So if you're in an organization, are there other people that are in other units that you need to get to know and build relationships with because they'll be helpful in providing you with insight, information, um, strategy, problem solving. So those are really important in terms of thinking about relationship management and how you get to wield your power and get things done. Um, because we rarely get things done as managers without having someone else influence sort of the outcome of that decision or the conversation. So I want to move on to, you know, building a community of trust. And, and that was obviously a big piece of this and really thinking about um, what a community is. So in my mind, I've decided that I'm deputizing all of you and you've all become the mayor of a city. So congratulations. You are all now mayor of your own city. And when you have someone who is a leader of a city, just as a manager, um, there are many different things that you have to think about. Um, and one of the things that's really important is uh, diversity. And so I'm going to pull up my slides again and share um, here something that is called a diversity wheel um, so that you can think a little bit about diversity in a complete spectrum. So I don't know if anyone wants to pop into the chat what they think diversity is and how it shows up for them. I don't see anything here. So one of the things that I really want to stress is that each and every one on this screen is diverse. And there is the diversity wheel where there are things that we are not going to change about themselves. I am not going to change the fact that I am a Black person. I am not going to um, change the fact I could, that I color my hair, that I have Black hair, brown hair. But there are certain things that are just innate to who we are. And then there are other things that change. I was married, but then I got divorced. I lived in Tennessee, but then I moved to a to uh, Maryland. But it's really important to keep all of these pieces in mind because every one of your employees and every one of the citizens of your city is going to have a component of diversity that is very unique to who they are. And so it's really sometimes difficult, I know, to see all of that in everyone at once, but we really have to try to sort of start building equity from the start with inclusion and really thinking about what all of those pieces are, which are just like different fingerprints. Each of them makes us unique in our own way. 
And it's really important for thinking about sort of how we are thinking about building our teams, how we're thinking about hiring, how we think about managing and helping our employees. So I'll give you an example of, as a manager at one point in time, I had an employee that was not sort of showing up in the way that I thought they should be for the job that they had and they were having certain issues with writing and other things. And what I didn't realize is that they actually needed some other tools to help them because they had a disability where they just needed to process information differently and have other tools in order to make them successful. So many times as a manager, you might have an individual who for some reason isn't performing in the way that you want. And we have to lead with sort of that curiosity to say, well, there might be a reason as to why. So you can't say to someone, do you have a disability as you know, an employer, but you can say, is there anything that I can do to help you do your job better? Do you have all the tools you need to be successful in your job? And if you don't, what are the tools that you would need in order to be more successful? So as sort of mayor of your own city, never lose sight of the fact that diversity shows up in many different ways. And you really have to be mindful of how you're messaging, how you're engaging, and assumptions that you're making, your conscious and your unconscious biases um, as you're building your community of trust. So the next thing, once you're aware of what diversity is and how to sort of honor all those different pieces that people come to the table is, is understanding kind of what are the mission, values, um, vision of your city. There has to be a city charter and your organization most likely has that. And it's really important when anyone is working that they understand like, why am I here? What's the vision? What is it that I'm doing? What am I, what's the bottom line? How am I adding value to the organization? And so all of those components might already be um, ready-made by your organization. And sometimes you actually do have to make sure that you define and redefine for people, maybe in a more succinct manner in terms of kind of what those things are. So now you've got, you understand you have a diverse city, you wanna have it diverse, you understand what that is and how to show up. You've got your mission, vision, values. Now you have to think about like the culture in your city, right? Like what, kind of, what kinds of behaviors are acceptable? And you know, why does it matter? And what types of spaces are you creating in your city for people in terms of open communication? Do you have a culture where you have brave spaces which require people to enter into those spaces um, with agreements and not in a forced way where there can be open communication? because that's something that is really important in terms of building trust. That if I don't feel as if I am in a safe space, then I am not going to share the fact that I really think there's another way to solve that problem. And here's my idea. And one of the things as managers that is, has always been true for me is I'm only as good as my team. And so if my team doesn't feel that they can interact with me, if they don't feel they can trust me, um, it's really difficult to have the performance kind of be the way you want it to be. So do your, do your citizens feel safe in your city? Have you built trust? You know, what does that look like? Do their opinions, do their ideas count? Do they feel as if they're connected to the cause? Do they understand their role? Um, as I said before, do they have the tools they need to be successful? Have you created those feedback loops for them so that if something isn't going well, do they have a way to flag that for you? Um, because many times because of diversity, people feel very isolated and they don't necessarily want to come to you and say, you know what? I am the only minority in this organization and I'm having a difficult time because and I want to share that with you. So think about what feedback loops you can create that give people a safe space to be able to either give feedback in an anonymous way that gets to you or in an open way if you are in a, a space where you feel that can happen. 
Um, it's really, really important for trust building to really be mindful of the type of culture and community that you're building. And I was really trying to find an analogy where you easily, if you think about being a mayor, you know, all the things that are important to you living in your city of Baltimore. And so that's the same thing in a different microcosm in terms of leading and managing teams. Um, so think about all those things that are really important. So uh, the next kind of piece to think about is, so hiring is a really important part of what is going to make you successful as a manager. And successful teams um, mean equate to a successful manager. And managers have to do things, though, to help their teams show up. Um, because the citizens in your city, they matter because you will only be as successful as they are. So if you hire poorly, then you're not going to be able to sort of have the talent on the team that you need to be successful because there are going to be points in time where you're going to have to delegate. You're not going to be able to micromanage. Remember all those things, micromanaging was the number one sort of piece of the word cloud. And that's because as managers, we tend to want to control more because we think that if we control a lot more, We'll be able to make sure that everything is okay. But being part of a manager is kind of taking our foot off that and trusting others. Um, so we have to build that culture of trust in order for other people to show up. Um, so it really, to make your, your city attractive, if you hire good people, they're going to attract other good people. So, you know, whenever you're hiring, and this is a practice that I take, when I bring someone on, I always say, so who else do you know in your network that I should know, right? Because as a hiring manager, you always want to have other people that are sort of in your network. So even managers building your network, your external network, getting to know those people. So you have equally as good people um, coming into the organization. So they're going to help you build new buildings in your city. They're going to be projects that you have that you have to work on. So you really need to have uh, successful team members. There are a couple of things, and I do want to leave time for questions because I know we break at 4.50 that um, are important to think about and to have a baseline understanding of. And that is sort of number one is knowing who your human resource team is in your organization or in your company and making sure that you build those relationships with your HR professionals because as a manager, you will be relying on them a lot to provide you with guidance and to make sure that you are not going to open yourself up to liability personally and not going to open up your company to liability as well. Um, understanding the basics of employment law. So ask if there are any courses that are available or educational sessions. There's a lot that you can do online to learn a little bit. But it's really being mindful of your language. A rule of thumb is if you are unsure as to whether you should say something, do not say it until you check with someone else. Because once it's out there verbally or in writing, um, it is you know, out in the ether. And we all have made mistakes. I've made mistakes, and I'm sure I'll make mistakes in the future as well. Um, but it's really important to understand the basics of employment laws. So you can't ask people how old they are. You can't ask people details about whether they're married, whether they have children, if they have a disability. So all those things you need to be aware of um, before moving forward. One thing that sometimes we hear a lot is the person just does not fit in our organization. What does that mean? We all kind of know what that means, but organizational fit is actually not the best way to hire someone. And actually it means we are going to be very Stepford and we are going to be cloned and we're all going to be the same, which is not going to get you to the best results. Guaranteed, there is research out there. The more diverse your team is using the sphere of diversity that I showed you, um, the better the results will be. So um, what I'm going to suggest is that you look at competencies. And I know there's some materials that you're going to be getting 
after this session that will help you help guide you to places where you can get the information about competencies. So I do have a blog that I do on the side and there are certain blog posts that are about these topics. And so there's some links that you'll get so that you can dig in deeper because I know that we don't have very much time to cover a lot of these in depth, but the goal today is to highlight the important things that you can then go and get some more information about. So competencies have to do with what are the skills that are needed in order for you to be successful in that position. So when you're going into interviewing someone, going in without being prepared, which I have done, is a no-no. You really need to go in understanding, I need to know if this person's a critical thinker. I need to know if this person is a good communicator. I need to know if this person is strategic and asking questions around them. Because many times we go into a, an interview and we scan over the resume and then we meet with the person and we're like, they were so wonderful, but we have no idea if they actually are competent for the job that we are want that they're interviewing for. And you can hire a really nice person, but if they don't have the skills to do the job, or if you don't have the time to skill them up to do the job, um, then you find yourself in a, a different place. Um, I know that uh, we talked a lot about diversity and I want to sort of, before we go to some Q and A, I just wanna give you some data points. Um, from research that has been done. So for example, cognitive diversity can enhance team innovation by up to 20%. That is research-based. 43% of companies with diverse management exhibit higher profits, bottom line. 87% of the time, diverse teams will outperform individuals in decision-making that 91% of companies have implemented diversity workplace programs. However, a majority of the employees feel that they actually don't benefit from those programs. So I throw that in there so that you can understand that even though there are diversity inclusion belonging programs that are in all of our organizations, sometimes they're not really hitting the mark in terms of inclusion and so as managers, we really have to be mindful of that piece as well. And sort of a, another piece is just that the demographics are changing in the United States. And so there was a really interesting point by the Brookings Institute in terms of the census and that um, the U.S. will become minority white in 2042. And that's just because, you know, youthful minorities are the engine of our future growth. And so the demographics are constantly changing, which means managers have to change and also be aware um, of all those pieces because they are effective. I wanna get to questions really quickly, but time management is another big thing that I know I was supposed to touch on. I got it, Patty, time management. I'm not managing my time as wisely as I could have. I'm about three minutes over where I should be. But you know, being a manager is one of the most difficult positions, as I said. And so it's really important that you think about how you're going to manage your time for your people and also manage your time for yourself because you can get back to back to back to back meetings, Zoom in person, hybrid, and never have a chance to get to your emails and never have a chance to actually have thinking time. So in the resources you get, there is a blog that I did that kind of goes through, are you procrastinating? Because many times we are not using our time wisely because we're procrastinating. We don't want to work on that project. And then moving from there to say, am I blocking my calendar in the way that I should? Am I spending time on the things that I really should be spending my time on? Am I utilizing my resources wisely? Am I checking email as soon as it pops up because we have it on our phones, we have it on our computers? What I do is I really try to just do it three times a day and I try to be responsive within 24 hours if I can. Um, so the time management is going to be another really sort of difficult piece of being an individual contributor and also a manager leader as you are going to be both tactical 
and also strategic in the work that you do. So that for me um, was sort of some of the highlights I wanted to give you really as Erin Hankin sort of stressed, ask sort of those inquisitive questions, make sure that you're doing your active listening, think about emotional intelligence in terms of your self-awareness and relationship management. So really do work on your superpowers and your kryptonite. You need to be the mayor of your community, of your team, and really think about what those components are, and then really try to manage your, your time as wisely as possible. So with that, I would love to open it up to any questions um, that you have. And you can either pop them in chat, or if you want to use the, the raised hand feature, I am agile and I can, I can look for both. And I swear to you, my phone has not rung in two and a half years. And today is the one time it's rang twice. <laughs> is everybody here going to be a great manager then? Yes? Yes. I know someone has a question. You can pop it in the chat. I know you do. It is a landline. Oh, yeah, I'm going to apologize in advance because I don't remember how to do the raised hand feature, but I'll oh, no. jump in with a question <laughs> because I'm curious to know a little bit more about your strategy of checking email three times a day and just Im imagining there might be exceptions to that if there's something that might come in that would require you to carve out some time to think about it before responding in that 24 hours. So just curious to know if you do make exceptions or if you don't and how that process has evolved for you over time and how you got to the system of checking three times a day? Because I'm just am very yeah. intrigued by that. Yeah, no, it is a habit that I have had to um, build over time. I will do, usually before I hit the office, I do a quick scan and I take a look at the, the emails that are most urgent. And those are the ones that I open and then I decide before heading in, like, what am I going to tackle? I usually have a bit of time scheduled on my calendar so that I can be responsive to those emails. What's important for me is determining if something is truly urgent because I'm the type of personality that everything could be urgent because I want to be everything to everybody, but I can't be. So um, even though someone's email might not be urgent to me, it's going to be urgent for them. Um, but what I just try to do is if I can respond within 24 hours, I think that's a reasonable time frame. Um, sometimes we have more of a sense of urgency. And, you know, I do say to people, I do try to frame it as an, if you need something right away, please let me know. So even with my supervisor, if something is important, I will put important in the line so that that is something that pops up where there needs to be a more immediate um, response to it. But I, if you saw my calendar, I have blocks of time. Um, that I have a, an hour blocked for lunch every day, even though I know that the people that know me know that I am not usually eating for the whole hour, but part of that time is really going into my emails and, and checking them and making sure that if I need to respond. I also do aggregate my emails. So if a person has sent me five or six different emails during the course of the day, instead of just sending them intermittently, I batch them and then I send the responses, usually one after the other, because sometimes they need the email to forward to someone else. Um, so hopefully that's helpful, Kevin. Um, the question is, how do you see good managers assess their EQ blind spots? Once they've identified those blind spots, how do you see effective leaders address them? So um, I know that, uh, I, I'll just use myself as an example that one of the things that I've really had to work on is building networks because I really am an introvert. I am not an extrovert, even though at work, it is very easy for me to be an extrovert, which is very bizarre even to myself. When I come into work, I'm not feeling you know, withdrawn or anything. I'm very outgoing, but when I am driving home and I get home, I definitely need my quiet time and I don't need my device and I just need to unwind. And so one of the things that I didn't do well, and I've been much more conscious about, is build my networks. And I have worked with leadership coaches over time, 
to build my internal networks and my external networks. And that is what um, I really personally have focused on. And that is, you know, I, I'm intentional about setting up a certain number of meetings with people that I don't have, you know, I'm not necessarily, I might want to talk to them about a few things, but it's not a necessary meeting. It is a relationship building meeting. And so I try to have at least three of those a week if I can. Um, and then I try to have some time and I've been doing a lot, reaching out to people in the profession and just introducing myself. I know Kelly Chase, who's here, is someone that I reached out to about a year and a half ago out of the blue and she accepted my invitation. And then we met via Zoom and had a chance to meet. And I probably wouldn't be sitting here today, but for her. So um, that's sort of an example of how I've worked on things myself. And you just have to take those baby steps um, because for me, I might go for my downtime instead of that extra time spending it with someone else. And actually it's very rewarding doing that. Great. Do you have any advice for how to handle becoming a first time manager to people who are formerly peers. I'm sorry that I'm laughing because I know what that feels like and how to handle the change dynamic. Hi, Laura. <laughs> um, yes, so I think the first thing to do is um, to really have those conversations with your peers when you have um, been promoted into a position to just call out the obvious that our relationship has changed and now we have a working relationship that is a lot different than it was when it was a peer relationship. And sometimes people have been your friends or are still your friends and then you have to manage them and that's really difficult. So really having the conversation I think is always, communication is always key and setting up sort of those boundaries and saying, you're going to see me showing up differently because I'm in a different role and I have different expectations. And I'm now going to have expectations in terms of the team and managing and leading. And sometimes we might agree and sometimes we might not agree. Um, but I just want to acknowledge that having been a peer, you've known me in a different vantage point and now you're going to see me differently. It is really difficult for people. And I have been at this organization for 22 years. It's hard for people to see you differently as you move within an organization because they see you as they knew you. And um, the only way to change that is to sort of call out that I'm going to be showing up differently. So. Thanks for the question, Laura. Well, I, you might've answered my question, but I um, wanted to go back to, to the analogy you were saying about being the mayor of your own town. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you like build your own town when you're like working within like a town? So like if the culture of an organization is one way, but you want to start, you know, building the pieces of what you were talking about, I do, I've, I've tried to do that and I found that challenging, even sometimes here as chair of ELU. Um, trying to do things like a little bit differently. Like I loved what you were talking about, like skills and competency, which is something that we've done with like our executive council, um, which is great, um, but it's, you know, it's like slow steps. So I'm very curious yeah. um, about your thoughts about that. So culture building is a slow moving sport. <laughs> and that I think is what makes it difficult because most of us are type A personalities. And so we tackle culture with our type A, but really um, changing culture takes time. Um, so here at Johns Hopkins, there's the university culture, but there's sort of the state that you live in, there's the country that you're in, and then there's your city. And the good news is like, you get to create the culture in your city um, because most likely if your culture that you're building in your city is different, people are going to want to come to work for you and be on your team. And so one of the things that I always talk about is a Venn diagram and really understanding the things that matter and the things that you can control. And when those two, where those two concentric circles overlap, that little space in the middle is usually the only space that you can affect. So when you're doing your culture building, 
thinking about what you can control and what matters is where you're going to have the most movement and the most success. And sometimes I know I want to do sort of big, I like, I think big, I have ideas all the time. I scare my boss all the time because I've got a ton of ideas. Um, but I really have to like get down to the, so what is within my control if I'm wanting to do X? And then have the wins there because it's the wins that you have in your city that are going to help you change the culture of the state or of the country. And that's just the nature of um, organizations. And that's the beauty of being a manager, quite frankly. I really love it because I love my people. And um, when you have synergy, and it's not to say that there's never disagreement or discourse, but when you have great synergy information sharing and you have trust and you feel you can share your ideas, you can be creative and you can decide where it is you want to be creative and successful, um, then people will be more engaged. And you can use that then as the example to say, hey, we did this here with our program. And I think it really could be a multiplier and it could be exponentially more beneficial if it was done at that higher level. So I hope that helps, Kelly. Great. So Eric, I know that we are at a minute to five o'clock and I think I'm the one that's holding you sort of between your networking session, which I know someone said has come up constantly, which I love um, because networks are key. And that has always been something that I've been working on. And it's always been the thing that's the most rewarding for me. You know, once one time uh, I had a client tell me that he read a book uh, called Thank You for Being Late. And frankly, I can't think of any better reason to be late for something than, than to have the opportunity to let you go for another couple of minutes, because that was incredible. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, couple couple housekeeping reminders. Uh, if you are free, please stay on for, for the networking happy hour. Um, but also, too, we, we have many, many more upcoming events. Um, also, great opportunities to network. Um, so we actually have one May 22nd in the Canton area uh, for Hands on Hill, which is going to be a hit workout, park cleanup, uh, and, and happy hour. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and conclude the event. And for those of us that are free, let's hang out and do a little bit of virtual networking. Awesome.